Hey, Neil, uh, thanks a lot for coming and doing this uh, lecture. You know, as I looked at the material for the class and this topic in particular, this was just really outside of my comfort zone and expertise. Luckily, we got somebody on campus where it's right in line with the expertise. Um, unfortunately, you're not going to be in town uh, when the that. lecture actually happens, but I thought this would be a good topic for my research group as well. So uh, I think we can do this today and record it and, and have it ready for the uh, students for the astrobiology class. No problem. I will be in Spain when the class is on and uh, no guarantees that there will be any decent internet connection to do a, a live connect. So Off the grid. Yeah. It's good to be off the grid sometimes. Well, thanks again. No problem. All right, so I'm just going to take you through the history of the universe, um, somewhat abridged, and try and hit on a few key points along the way. Some of the key concepts that I want to uh, leave you with, I'm sure you've all heard that the universe is expanding, uh, and uh, what that actually implies is that uh, if you run the evolution back, it was a lot smaller, and if you continue to take that back, it actually goes back almost to a point. And uh, what we have now is good uh, observational evidence pointing to a hot big bang having occurred 13.7 billion years ago, where there's an error of around plus or minus 0.1 on that uh, second, uh, on, the, on the decimal place, which is remarkable because <clears throat> when I got to MSU uh, in the fall of 99, that number was known with maybe a plus or minus two billion years on it was where we were at. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about how we come up with those numbers uh, today. And the overall picture is the universe started off very hot and smooth. And as it expanded, it's cooled down and become clumpier. Uh, you would be familiar with the, uh, that as things expand, they cool. If you've ever taken one of those, uh, things in a soda fountain, the, the tank in a the little CO2 tank in a soda fountain and knocked a hole in it, spins around and then it gets really cold, I mean, icy, icy cold. So as, as things uh, expand, they cool and, and uh, the universe has, has cooled and gravity has caused it to clump up to the overall picture that we see. And one of the really important concepts um, is that this isn't just a creation myth. Uh, we actually have very strong observational support for this story right back to actually the first fraction of a second. Anything back beyond <clears throat> around about uh, a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang is more um, indirect because we can't see back that far using light, but we have strong indirect evidence for events that occurred right up to the first fraction of a second. So there's actually a wealth of uh, observational support now for this Big Bang model. And one of the things that's remarkable that's coming out of this is the matter that we're made of, the matter that's in this room, the matter that we think of as being ubiquitous, um, you know, the elements of the periodic table, that's actually an exceedingly tiny fraction of what the universe is made of. We're made of some of the rarest um, material in the universe. And so the universe is, the rest of the universe is really nothing like what we know on Earth. <clears throat> Most of the stuff in the universe is weird things, dark matter and dark energy, and we're just like the, you know, the froth on a cappuccino. We're just the tiniest fraction of what the universe is made of. So it's it's a hard thing to get your head around because, you know, we're familiar with uh, the materials on Earth, and we just think that that's you know the universe is made of that stuff, and it's not. So that's that's actually another concept that's uh, worth uh, emphasizing. So this is a big picture view of the universe, uh, a timeline with uh, time starting uh, <clears throat> here at the Big Bang, moving through to the present day. <clears throat> and we have uh, these various epochs. And I'll take you through some of these uh, important times in the history of the universe. The, uh, we have now strong observational evidence that there was an early period of extremely rapid expansion where the universe grew in size by um, enormous factors in a tiny, tiny fraction of a second. And at the end of that extremely rapid expansion, the 
universe that with the visible universe that we see today is sort of around about the size of a grapefruit. And it's continued to expand out from there. And as it's expanding, being cooling down, um, it finally cooled down. There's an important moment right here where we have this uh, mottled pattern. Um, that's actually the afterglow of the Big Bang that I'll talk a little bit about that we see in microwaves of the hot Big Bang. Uh, before that, the universe was so hot and dense that light really couldn't get anywhere. It was um, scattering off charged particles. It's like in the sun today. We don't see, when you look at the sun, you don't see the center of the sun. You just see the outer corona. This is really like the outer corona of the universe. It, it was too hot and dense um, to look back any further than that. And uh, finally, it cooled down to the point where electrons could combine with... Uh, nuclei, mostly hydrogen, and become a, um, or protons to form hydrogen gas. And so hydrogen and helium gas then was what most of the universe was consisting of in at this uh, epoch. And it's called the Dark Ages because there, there was, at, at that time, there was no stars. Had not, the, that gas hadn't yet collapsed to form stars or galaxies. <clears throat> so it was just hydrogen and helium gas that wasn't burning. It was just sitting there. But light can travel very easily through hydrogen and helium gas. And so we... We can, uh, and then really from the rest of the universe on, it's been essentially uh, transparent to light going through it. So we can see back to this uh, um, radiation pattern, the afterglow of the Big Bang, which is about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. And that's as far as we can see back using light. So anything that I tell you back at earlier times, we infer in different ways. But we actually have direct measurements of this light and then of all of the um, light that's come since, from when the first stars formed up around 400 million years ago. Actually, we don't have any images of those yet. Uh, hopefully, if we get to fly the James Webb telescope, we'll um, get to see further back and into this era of the first stars. But then the first galaxies, and then onward. This is all imaged. I think with Hubble, the furthest we've got are galaxies that are around 12.6 uh, or 12.7 billion uh, <clears throat> years ago, so we see galaxies back um, from about a billion years after the Big Bang and have those imaged. So I'm going to take you through this and talk about some of the process that occurred and how we've actually been able to figure out this story. Here is uh, one of the devices that <clears throat> has, has really greatly increased our understanding of the universe, the Hubble um, telescope. It's really our time machine that has allowed us to look back through this history. So it's a historical science, but unlike uh, you know, someone like, like Jack Horner who has to go and dig up his dinosaur bones, the analogy for us is that we actually would be watching a movie of those dinosaurs. We actually see the events that happened um, millions of years ago by looking at the light that's taken millions of years to get here. We're seeing the universe, um, how it was, uh, billions of years ago. So we actually have pictures of the universe from 2.7 billion years ago, and we actually see the stars and the processes that are going on there. So it makes it a lot easier for us. We don't have to guess and try and reconstruct it from fossil remnants. We just, we just get to see it. Uh, here is a image, and a, uh, it's going to go into motion in a moment. This is actually the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. What they did is they pointed the Hubble at a... Um, a point on the sky that was completely devoid of any stars and just sat there taking extremely long exposure. And then what's been done now is that image has been um, put inside a computer and based on the colors of the galaxies, actually the shifting of the wavelengths of the light, we've been able to assign a distance to each galaxy. And then using a, a computer animation, now that we've added a distance to the image, this is now a fly into that um, Hubble Deep Field, and so we're going further and further back in time, further and further away, and as we get to the edge here of where Hubble didn't see anything else, these galaxies are out around 12 billion years um, after the big, I mean, so these were formed, uh, those galaxies are around, around a billion and a half years after the Big Bang, and then it goes blank. That wasn't so much that Hubble uh, didn't have the collecting power to see any further, uh, there's a couple of reasons why it doesn't see any stars past there. One is their light has shifted outside of its range. It only sees in the visible and the near infrared. And if you go back any further, the light from those stars got 
redshifted by the expansion so much that it's no longer even in the infrared. So if you want to see any further, you actually have to go further into the infrared and start going down into microwave radiation because the, uh, that early afterglow of the Big Bang actually was at pretty much the same temperature as the sun, but instead of being able to see it as visible light, the expansion of the universe, the universe has expanded by a factor of a thousand th since then, and so that light now is now seen as, as microwave radiation. So you actually have to use a microwave detector to see the light any further back. And the other reason why it doesn't release anything back there is it really is getting to the edge of the dark ages. There really were no stars and galaxies uh, back there. At least we don't think there is. And that's one of the things that the um, successor to the Hubble is supposed to investigate. It'll be looking further into the infrared and, uh, <clears throat> and looking to see the, some of the very, very early proto-galaxies and, and first stars. We have indirect evidence that these things were going on back then, but not direct images of them. This is what you see right out at the edge of the universe. Um, it's kind of boring. It is a glow of microwave radiation that corresponds to a temperature of 2.728 degrees Kelvin. Okay? It was around 3,000 Kelvin, um, this gas cloud that this, these microwaves were coming from. This was the gas filling the universe at the time. It was around about 3,000 Kelvin at the point where the uh, <clears throat> electrons combine with the ions to form neutral gas. And what's remarkable about it, it's the same in every direction. This is an all-sky map. It's a bit like when you take a, um, the globe and you unwrap it onto a um, two-dimensional uh, image of the globe, but we've done that for the sky around us. Um, so it's the same thing. It's the whole sky. And every direction you look in, you see the same temperature. And it's not until you actually get an instrument that can detect differences down in the fifth decimal place that you can start to see that it's not exactly uniform. And so this is the image then from the, uh, in, now on a micro Kelvin scale. So fluctuations happening in the fifth and sixth decimal place. Uh, that you see that the universe wasn't exactly the same temperature in every direction. The blue areas are where it was somewhat colder. The red areas was a little bit hotter. And those slight differences in temperature are caused by the universe being somewhat denser in some regions and somewhat less dense, but only by parts in a million or parts in, or 10 parts in a million or so. So extremely uniform. And that's what happened because of this extremely rapid expansion. It sort of smoothed out all the wrinkles. You know, if you take something that's wrinkly, like a wrinkly balloon, and then you blow it up, all the wrinkles go away. And so any um, wrinkles that might have been there originally were essentially wiped out. What we, this pattern was actually predicted by some uh, Russians back in the 70s, and then later by, uh, independently by people in the West, including uh, Stephen Hawking. And... These, these, these fluctuations, these slight differences in temperature, these slight differences in density, are actually due to um, quantum fluctuations in the universe. So these aren't even like thought to be, we're now fairly confident, these aren't primordial um, wrinkles from before this inflation. These are actually the amplification of quantum fields during the expansion. So this is a, an imprint, this is a macroscopic imprint of a, of a quantum... Um, quantum fluctuations. So the structure that uh, then, so these were then the seeds from which galaxies form. Those denser areas then collapsed, and those are where the galaxies and clusters of galaxies are. The less dense areas are these enormous voids between galaxies. So I'll say a little bit more about that later on, show some computer simulations. The universe is, has this bubble-like structure where we have immense voids, um, hundreds of millions of light years across where there's just nothing and then there's a, um, a structure of galaxies uh, sort of like soap film um, with huge voids in between. Okay, so one of the concepts that you that is in the uh, textbook for this astrobiology course is trying to get a sense of the time and space scales of the universe and it's really difficult to wrap your head around these scales. They're so far outside of our ordinary um, human length and time scales that you can try in many ways to understand them, but uh, I think you end up just getting awed by it, but not necessarily being able to comprehend it in a sort of uh, visceral sense. So 
just to begin the uh, exploration of the length scales of the universe, there's the Earth. Um, it isn't actually that close to the sun, really. Uh, this coronal mass ejection would offer uh, some danger if we were really parked up that close to the sun. But this is to scale. So there's the Earth and the sun to scale. The sun is 100, the diameter of the sun is 109 times that of the Earth. I think those of you that have flown uh, from you know, the US to Europe or whatever, you've got some sense of how big the Earth is. It's pretty big. Um, the sun, 109 times bigger, okay? Now if we took the sun and shrunk it down to the smallest thing that we probably have a good feel for, maybe without using a microscope, would be like a grain of sand, something you know, a bit less than a millimeter. Okay, so if you did that, if you shrunk the sun down to the size of a grain of sand, light on that scale would now be moving at the speed of a snail, and the nearest star on that scale would be 60 kilometers away. And that snail would take 4.2 years to crawl its way <laughs> those 60 kilometers to get to the other star. And that is the kind of scale we're talking I mean, that is the nearest star, 4.2 light years away. And on the scale where the sun is a grain of sand, it's 60 kilometers away. So here's a little... Uh, factor of 10 zoom out of the universe. So the sun is big and the universe is very big. We've got the sun, here's the nearest star, um, Proxima and Alpha Centauri. And this is 10 light year scale here. These are the nearest stars we have in the sky. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of them in a moment, Tau Ceti in particular. Okay, so that's a 10 light year scale. And these are the nearby stars. You see these when you look out at night. These are some of the brightest stars in the sky. Zooming out another factor of 10, to 100 light years. These are actually some other stars that you can see quite well um, with the naked eye, including uh, some of the uh, giant stars uh, somewhere in there. I'm not quite seeing where it is. Should be Betelgeuse, but um, I'll be talking about that in a moment. So that's just the near na solar neighborhood, 100 light years. Now going out to 1,000 light years, you start to see the um, belts of the Milky Way, okay? Zooming out further to 10,000 light years, the galaxies now um, on that scale of uh, <clears throat> around, uh, let's see, 90,000 light years across. And we start to see some of the dwarf galaxies that are orbiting the Mil Milky Way, the Sagittarius dwarf. Um, did I miss? Oh, no, here they are. Here's some other dwarf galaxies in orbit around the Milky Way, the Large Magellanic Cloud, the Small Magellanic Cloud. Those of you that have been to the Southern Hemisphere uh, will have seen those. The, um, the Sagittarius dwarf is kind of hard to see because it's so close, but the, it sort of gets confused with the rest of the stars in the galaxy. But you can actually see these. These are orbiting around. We swallow these small galaxies all the time. Uh, the Milky Way has eaten at least 40 dwarf galaxies in its history. We just keep on accreting them and gobbling them up. And we see them as stripped tails. We, there's, there's bands of stars in the galaxy, which are these dwarf galaxies that we've captured, and then we're tidally stripping them. So there's all these star flows through the Milky Way where it actually are these other galaxies that we've eaten, small galaxies. And so we keep on eating these small galaxies. Uh, in around about, I think, six billion years time, we're going to encounter and try and eat a much bigger galaxy, Andromeda. And that's going to get messy because Andromeda is as big as we are. And um, I don't think you want to be around when that happens. Uh, so that's on the 100,000 light year scale. We've got our little dwarf galaxies that are satellites to us. As you move out, you get to the local group of galaxies. So a million light years now. Milky Way, uh, Andromeda out here, which we're on our way to collide with. We're actually kind of all moving together here. Gravity's pulling us in. And uh, you can, these are the... Um, these you can, you know, you can see Andromeda quite well with binoculars and so some of these galaxies you can see fairly well. That's just the local group of galaxies. Going another factor of 10 to 10 million years, you now start seeing these clusters of galaxies, including the Virgo cluster, one of the nearest large clusters. Uh, out by another factor of 10, and now we're seeing these super clusters of galaxies all clumped up. Out by 
another factor of 10, and now we've pretty much got all the galaxies in the visible universe. There's about 300 billion large galaxies like the Milky Way. There's trillions of dwarf galaxies. Each of those large galaxies has hundreds of billions of stars in it, so you can do the math. Hundreds of billions of stars times hundreds of billions of large galaxies, and you have a huge number of stars out there, and probably a good fraction of those stars with planets around them, so there are lots of places to go looking for life in the universe. Now, I want to repeat some of what I just said, but rather than now talking about the distances, I want to focus in on the times involved. And this idea that our telescopes are really time machines. Let's go back to this uh, first one at 10 light years. This Tau Ceti. Tau Ceti is the nearest sun-like star, G-type star. And here's an artist's uh, image of Tau Ceti. It has a large uh, debris disk, a protoplanetary disk. It's actually a little bit older than the sun. It could well have formed planets. We've got no evidence right now there are any planets around it, but it, it could well have some rocky planets. It might even have some large planets in far orbits like we have, but we haven't seen them yet. Uh, there's a selection effect on how we see planets, and so far we haven't seen any around Tau Ceti. It's 12 light years from Earth, but if there was someone, you know, on Tau Ceti watching TV signals from the Earth, uh, we actually still did broadcast TV back then. Uh, now with cable, the aliens won't be able to get our news so easily. Uh, but back then, they would actually be right now getting news. It was the Senate um, trial of Bill Clinton at the time, uh, and uh, he was acquitted 12 years ago in that Senate trial. So that would be the news. That was the big news back 12 years ago. So that's what they would be hearing about. Um, if we go a little further out to Betelgeuse, which is around about 643 light years from Earth, <clears throat> you can very easily see Betelgeuse in the night sky one of the brightest objects. It's a giant star, a super giant. Um, this is another artist's image of what's going on. It is in its final death throes. It's a very large star that's now gone super giant. It's blowing off its outer layers, which is actually helping to enrich the, uh, you know, the neighborhood with all sorts of elements uh, for making planets for future star building. And it's really, it's pulsating, it's very unstable. It's very old in its, its uh, life right now, in terms of it's at the very far end of the supergiant life. It could well have already exploded as a type, we believe it's going to explode as a type 2 supernova. It could have already happened, because we're seeing light from 643 years ago. At the time, it was the founding of the uh, Ming Dynasty in China, and the beginning of the building of the Great Wall. So we're seeing it back, you know, we're seeing the light that started its journey from Betelgeuse. This is what was happening on Earth at the time, right? So we're, and it could well have already exploded. It'll actually be easily naked eye visible during the day. It'll be very bright. Um, it could be deadly, but probably not, because it's not, its spin axis isn't, isn't aimed at the Earth. If it was, there'll be jets, gamma ray jets coming down its spin axis. Could annihilate all the life that gets, you know, is under that beam because it's a very nearby supernova so it'll be dramatic I mean it'll be it'll light up the night the daytime sky at night it'll be just you know like having another sun for a while it'll be pretty spectacular uh, but it doesn't look like it will kill us so it's all right um, okay let's go a little further out and if we look to the galactic center which is about 20,000 um, light years away so we're seeing it about 20,000 years ago this is what you see there. This is actually a real image, not a computer simulation, taken over many years. <clears throat> These are stars moving around the center of um, the Milky Way, and they're orbiting something very large. You can't see it. It has a mass of 4 million times the mass of the Sun. It's a huge black hole at the center of our galaxy. It's um, quiescent right now. It's not, um, it's not spewing out radiation. Typically, these black holes uh, spew out radiation, and uh, ours right now hasn't eaten anything recently, so it doesn't have any, uh, but it needs to accrete gas and stars onto it, and then it, it but at the times in the past, our black hole has, has spewed out a lot of radiation, but right now it's quiet, so we only know about it from the effect of stars orbiting around it. Every galaxy 
seems to have one of these giant black holes in the middle. Um, and yeah, back back then, what was going on on Earth? It was uh, the middle of the last ice age. So, you know, light from uh, the light we're seeing began its journey uh, <clears throat> twenty thousand years ago. So that's the sense in which we're really looking at a time machine. Carl Sagan uh, liked to try and give you a sense of give people a sense of the the vastness of time in the universe by trying to put the in the same way I was trying to shrink that the sun down to a grain of sand, he would try and put the entire history of the universe onto a calendar for one year, okay? Because people can understand a year. It's hard to understand billions of years. On that kind of calendar, the Big Bang, of course, happening on January 1st, by January 10th, we had the first stars had formed, okay? So they were pretty quick in getting going. Uh, the Milky Way was formed by March. The sun, our, our solar system, the planets and the sun formed in August. Our sun is actually formed from the remnants of many other stars and supernova, so ours isn't anywhere near a first-generation star. We're made out of a lot of recycled material. The early stars were made out of um, mostly just hydrogen and helium, and it was only through, as they burnt that into, uh, fused that into higher ele um, uh, heavier elements and metals on the periodic table, that we eventually got to the point where you'd have uh, the possibility of having rocky planets and things. So our sun is formed from the remnants of many supernova and other exploded stars, and so we're quite a late system. Remarkably, I think by September we had life on Earth, and you know, uh, it wasn't very exciting at first. But by November it was multicellular. December really things got going. Um, dinosaurs wiped out on the 29th. And we came in at six minutes to midnight for the uh, New Year's party. Modern humans appeared. So on that scale, we've been around for six minutes. Uh, still, I don't know if you can quite get your head around how vast the time scale of the universe is. <clears throat> this is an animation, actually a computer simulation of galaxy formation. And what I'm illustrating here is that whenever you see these images of the universe, it always looks so static, right? Because we've just taken this picture. And even if we put our cameras on the universe for hundreds of years, you wouldn't really see much change. But this is over a time scale of billions of years in a computer simulation showing um, where, what they did is they're using supercomputers to model every little particle here with its gravitational interaction, feedback from the stars putting out radiation. So fully simulating the computer, uh, the universe on a computer this is the kind of thing that was going on with the Milky Way. See, there's a, a clump that's now formed up, and it's swallowing all these little, has these little satellite galaxies whirring around and swallowing them and stripping them. And that is the process that <clears throat> went into forming up the Milky Way. And it's still going on today. We're still um, pulling in these uh, satellite galaxies. They are orbiting around us and getting pulled in. So the universe, we just it looks static to us because we're viewing it on a time scale that is so short compared to the relevant scales and what things are really happening. Uh, but it's extremely dynamic when you look at it over uh, billions of years of history. And this, yeah, all over the universe, all the different galaxies have been doing this sort of thing. So, <clears throat> and it just keeps on going and going. Um, I'm going to now take you through just some of these keys. <clears throat> Uh, times in the history of the universe. So it's a similar picture to the one I showed earlier. And so the Big Bang, which we don't, you know, understand that well because the, uh, the laws of physics as we currently understand them break down when you try and take them right back to this um, point of inf infinite density. It's a very er active area of research to try and understand uh, this Big Bang process. It may be the popular idea right now is that there are actually many Big Bangs um, almost a uh, sort of called something called eternal inflation where you have different patches of space sort of exploding out um, completely disconnected it's kind of the image that they give the picture they give is a, a, like a ginger root where there's you know a universe sort of expanded out here and another one over here we have absolutely no way to communicate or um, have any contact with those other universes so they're in some sense outside of scientific study but they are the predictions of the theories so theories that we use to describe physics in this universe that work really well here 
if we extrapolate them, they suggest that this should be happening with this sort of sprouting of lots of universes. It's not really something that we can test directly, at least no one, you know, because they're causally distinct from us, but that's the picture that we have. Anyway, then there was this extremely rapid expansion, which ended after about 10 to the minus 32 seconds. So you might think, well, if we've got a, if we understand the universe pretty well from say 10 to the minus 32 seconds onward, on for the next 13.7 billion years, who really cares about that first 10 to the minus 32, right? I mean, in back there. But really, the, the, the ticking of a clock that we, that, like we use today is really not the right way to view time in the universe. Notice this is on a logarithmic scale because I've got 10 to the minus 32 here, one second here, 300,000 years there, one billion there, and then 12. Really, uh, what, a, what matters is not so much the ticking of a clock, it's the rate at which things are happening. And things were happening far more rapidly back here than they are out here. So more stuff actually happened in the first second of the universe than happened since, if you just measured it in terms of like processes that occurred. So most of the history of the universe actually happened in the first second. It's been very slow moving since then, and not much has happened. So far more happened in that first second than it's happened since. So looked at it that way, um, <clears throat> that's our excuse for studying the early part of the universe, even though it only counts for about a second. Okay, so as it, um, uh, at the end of inflation, we had almost equal amounts of matter and antimatter. That's what the yin yang symbol is there. Okay? It turned out for every 1 billion matter particles, um, there was one less antimatter particle. And when the matter and antimatter, it was extremely cold actually after this period of inflation because the universe had just grown by factors, exponential factors. So it was, it was absolute zero, basically. It was completely cold. <clears throat> but it was filled up with matter and antimatter in almost equal amounts. That, anter that matter and antimatter is, if you're Star Trek fans, you know what happens if your uh, um, antimatter containment fails. And the matter and antimatter get together, annihilate into photons, pure energy. right? And that's what happened. Basically, for every one billion and one matter atoms, or no, atoms at that time, but matter particles, meeting one billion antimatter, they almost all annihilated, except there was this very slight excess of matter over antimatter. We don't know exactly why. If there hadn't been, well, we wouldn't be here to talk about it. Um, but there is this one part in a billion um, excess of matter over antimatter. The rest annihilated and made the universe incredibly hot with a little tiny trace of matter. Then it continued to expand, and it got to the point where it was just quarks. Um, the constituents of protons and neutrons were um, just bobbing around. But it was so hot that the, the protons, and, protons and neutrons hadn't formed up yet because they would hit each other if they try and form up, and they'd just fly apart again to, into just free quarks. So it wasn't until it actually cooled down at around one second that they could finally condense into blobs and actually form protons and neutrons. It was just too hot and too energetic to even have protons. It was like a giant atom smasher like we have at the Large Hadron Collider, just smashing them the whole time. And so they kept on getting broken up into their constituents. So at around one second, they actually condensed to form protons and neutrons. And then uh, slightly after that, in the within the first few minutes, further condensation could occur where the protons and neutrons could start sticking together to form um, helium and lithium and some of the heavy, heavier elements. And again, earlier on, it, they would form up, but then another proton or neutron would come in and smash it and break it apart again. So it was only, there was a very short window right there where things could actually glob together with sufficient energy to get past the um, repulsive electrostatic barriers and get together, but not get you know, not get smashed apart again. So it was a sort of a fight between destroying them and globbing them together. And so it was this very tight window of a few, happened in a few minutes that um, most of the um, helium and globbed together at that time. Further, going further out to around 400,000 years after the uh, Big Bang, <clears throat> that's when I've already talked about this. This is when the gas now, the hydrogen helium gas, which was ionized, was a plasma, 
um, finally cooled down and expanded to the point that the electrons could combine and not be knocked off. So it's all the same, sort of same thing. It's like con wanting to condense down, but it's too hot. Um, so finally, at this stage, it went to neutral hydrogen helium gas. That's where we see this. This is where we. That's as furthest back we can see in light, seeing in microwaves. And then we had the first stars around 400,000 years after the Big Bang. We've got indirect evidence about those from what they did to the microwave radiation. Uh, first galaxies, and then finally the Earth. So. How do we uh, put this picture together? Cosmology is, it works on the very larger scales and the very smaller scales. So on the very larger scales, we have the images of, from the satellites like the Hubble. But to understand it all, we also have to understand the workings of matter on the very smaller scales. So the quarks and the electrons, the neutrinos, photons, gravitons, and those we learn about through the, uh, the colliders on Earth and a lot of interesting uh, results coming, starting to come in from the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, nothing too dramatic yet, but they're really, it's working very well. We'll probably, um, we don't actually, you know, big mysteries like where, does, where do all these uh, particles get their mass from is one of the things they're trying to understand. And in the next year or so, we hope to get a lot of answers from the Large Hadron Collider. So it's an exciting time in fundamental particle physics, but we have to use these understandings from fundamental particle physics to tell us about how these processes work um, inside uh, the early universe and, and in stars. So on the biggest scales, the theory that um, the, most, the big player on large scales is gravity, and in, in particular, Einstein's picture of gravity is what's relevant for cosmology, which uh, Wheeler summarized it as saying that matter tells space how to curve, and space tells matter how to move. So it's a, it's a rather, there's really no force of gravity, according to Einstein. It's just that matter causes this bending of space, and then just as objects move around, they're trying to take the straightest path they can on a curved surface. That then leads to the, um, to the orbits we see of planets basically rolling around in this bowl. Is, is the picture. So there actually is no gravitational force in Einstein's theory of gravity. Um, it's just a bending of space and then things trying to make their way in a bent space. If you, uh, if you apply Einstein's theory to a collapsed star, <clears throat> you get that the space is so bent, the green is uh, for that point where its future lies and red is its past. What happens is it tips your future over into the, your future points into the black hole. So space and time kind of bend over, and so your, your future lies at the singularity at the center of the black hole. There's no way out um, because your future actually, whatever you try and do, the only way to go is towards the um, singularity. If you, if you apply Einstein's theory to the universe, um, you get predictions for its expansion. If you don't have anything strange like dark energy, then if the universe was curved, if space was curved like the um, surface of a sphere, then you'd expect the universe to expand. It's, you know, it's like throwing something up in the air. At first it's going up, but then sort of gravity's pulling it back together again, and it would eventually recollapse. Um, if it was curved more like the, a, a saddle, you'd expect it to expand forever. Um, <clears throat> If you put this uh, strange dark energy into the picture, then you expect all of these possibilities to lead to expansion that goes on forever, and not only goes on forever, but actually speeds up. And that's actually what we're seeing, which is um, rather like throwing a rock up in the air, and instead of it coming down, you see it just take off. Someone's, like someone's attached a, a rocket to it. Um, so one question I get a lot about universe expanding is, okay, well, where was the Big Bang? And you see these things on Discovery Channel where they'll show, you know, this explosion in space. So the space is already there and this sort of thing explodes out into it. Terrible um, representation because it's so, uh, it tells the, such the, the wrong story. The Big Bang didn't happen at any one point. It happened everywhere. Space is uniformly expanding. It's like taking, I've just got a field of dots here. I've colored a couple of them, a few of them just to, got a green one, a 
a blue one and a, a red one. But if you just took this picture and you stuck it on a photocopier and say increased it by 10%, okay? Just expand it, okay? So I just expanded it out. Now let's overlay the, the original and the expanded version. And I'll overlay it so it's centered on the blue one, okay? Now, the space between this point and this point has increased by 10%, but it was, say, you know, let's call it one unit. Well, this one's two units away, so I increase that by 10%, but that then means I get 0.2 units of extra distance, right? Out here, I get 0.3 units of extra distance. So the further something is away, the more actual distance between you and that point has actually grown. And so while it's a uniform expansion, the things that are further away have actually moved even further away than you. And this is actually what we're seeing when Hubble first saw that the universe was expanding. Um, he was just seeing it through the objects appearing to be moving away with a certain speed. But we now interpret that as the, those objects aren't moving, it's the space actually in between that's growing. So, you know, there is no need to have a space that things explode into. The, um, according to Einstein, space itself grows, okay? And you can try this for different points, and it works just as well for any point. So everyone thinks they're at the center of the universe, because the expansion really is centered on you. But it's true for everyone as well. <laughs> so it really does look like everyone's moving away from you, but everyone else thinks that as well. So there's no... Um, you don't have to have a center. Um, it looks like we have a center to the expansion, but everyone equally is at the center of their own personal little expansion. So uh, that's, that's really what's happening is we've got a uniform expansion of space. And this is the data that um, tells us about this. Redshift is a measure, a proxy for speed. So slowly, move, things are moving away slowly are here. Things are moving away quickly are here. Things that are near and things that are far. Unfortunately, astronomers use funny units like magnitude and redshift. But this is the data that shows that the further you go out, the faster things are moving away. And also the evidence that um, we now have that the universe is not only um, expanding, but the rate of expansion is, is increasing. So uh, the other... One of the other lines of evidence that has really helped us pin down these, this picture is with this WMAP satellite. Uh, there's now a new satellite, a European satellite, Planck, which is making a higher resolution map of this microwave radiation. <clears throat> but it's also taught us a lot. So again, looking uniform at first, but then these small fluctuations. The, this particular pattern of radiation tells us a lot. We can actually take this and spectrally an analyze it just as you would a... Um, you know, if I took a musical uh, piece and I, you might have seen it like, you know, on a graphic equalizer where you see how much treble and bass, so, you know, technically like a Fourier transform, um, so you're breaking it up into its different, how much power at different frequencies, and we can do that on a sphere, so we take this picture and we break it up into um, how, how rough it is on different scales, essentially, and we learn a lot, and the idea is that since then, the universe has... This is showing the uh, evolution in a computer of the universe, starting from that condition of it being almost uniform. We see it clumping up to form the galaxies and then these huge hundreds of millions of light year across voids, um, which is the picture we actually see. You know, I was saying a soap bubble-like structure with uh, the galaxies really just on these thin sheets and filaments and then huge empty regions in between. And that's really what we see. This is, of course, projected into two dimensions, but... This is an all-sky map of uh, galaxies, and we see these bubble-like structures in these huge voids. Um, one of the tricky things is it turns out that most of the mass in the universe is actually invisible. It's, uh, it doesn't give off any light. And so be, to be able to measure that, what we actually use is, here's the idea, is that if you had these objects as they move through this curved space caused by all the other objects, the light takes funny paths, and so the image gets bent, okay? It's called gravitational lensing, and it's just the, the light moving its way through a curved universe that's curved by the material in it. So this is actually how we figure out 
where things are, you know, we can see these stars in the background, but the light from them, or these stars and galaxies, is all bent into these giant arcs. So these are galaxies that are very in the, and there's this, there's a huge cluster of galaxies here with lots of dark matter in them, and the galaxies far behind, the light we see from them is bent into these huge arcs, and we can actually reconstruct how much mass is there by the amount of bending and, and these arc structures. So even though we can't see there's a huge amount of material in there, we can actually tell it's there from the amount of bending it causes of these images of background galaxies. Um, and putting all of these things together across all the scales of the universe, from tens of millions of light years out to um, you know, millions of millions of light years, and going from... Uh, smooth to rough, so fluctuations in density of parts in a million all the way up to sort of order one uh, density differences. I mean, where we are, it's very clumpy right here. I mean, I'm here and then it's sort of fairly empty. Uh, and we see that on the very largest scales, the universe is extremely smooth. On the very smaller scales, the universe is very lumpy. And this is data taken from all sorts of different um, ways of, of measuring uh, how things are clumped up across the universe. And by comparing this to our models, and we can do the same, uh, this is a measure of smooth to rough and large to small using images of this um, image of the universe. We can stick it into our universe machine, where here are various quantities, I'm not going to tell you what they are, that go into determining from our Einstein's theory of gravity plus our theories of matter, what the universe should look like and what this pattern should look like. And then we just dial these parameters around. You see it changes the prediction, the red line's the prediction, the black with hash marks of the current data. It's actually from a few years ago, now we have better data. And you can see you can just like tweak that parameter around until you get the data to match the, um, the, the theory to match the data. And you can do that with all these parameters. And by figuring out, you know, fitting all these different parameters to the data, we're actually able to read off all of these quantities, like how, how curved is the universe and how much dark energy and all this sort of thing. And the picture that comes out of this is pretty remarkable. The com combination of all the different observations we've done in cosmology tell us that roughly 70% of the universe is made up of dark energy, which is uh, basically <clears throat> just energy that doesn't clump together, it's uh, not really like particles. 25% um, is dark matter, so that's just matter that doesn't in any way interact with light. <laughs> we don't know what that is. We have a few good ideas about what the dark matter might be, um, and it's quite likely within the next five to ten years that we'll actually be able to directly detect this dark matter. There's a lot of dark matter detectors out there, and uh, there's some very rare interactions, so they have these huge tanks of material where they're just looking for this, you know, event that happens once every, you know, many years. So it, I think that we're on the cusp of actually directly detecting what the dark matter particles are. Also, this Large Hadron Collider is in the process of potentially creating some of these dark matter particles directly, and then we'll be able to um, uh, infer that it's there by the fact that there was a bunch of stuff missing from the reactions because we have no way the detectors there can't detect dark matter but they can tell that they miss something. So I'd say probably in the next five to ten years we'll actually know what the dark matter is so that won't be such a mystery. The dark energy is really confusing. We don't really have a good idea about what that is. Um, now getting more into the stuff we're familiar with, hydrogen and helium make up about four percent of the material in the universe. Um, most of it's just out there in big clouds. About 0.5% of it's in stars. About 0.3% of the stuff in the universe is neutrinos. And there's about a billion neutrinos going through you per second. Okay, In your lifetime, one or two will actually hit an atom in your body, maybe a chlorine atom, and cause a reaction. But generally, this goes straight through billions per second, never bothering you. But the stuff, the heavy elements, um, sort of anything heavier than hydrogen and helium, that's 0.03% of the stuff in the universe. Okay, so what we think of as being, you know, our periodic table is a tiny part of the whole story. 0.03% of the stuff in the universe. Stuff that you make life out of. And if you go back to this Big Bang nuclear synthesis when the hydrogen um, fused together to form helium, 
<clears throat> these are the predictions of how much relative to hydrogen, how much helium we should have, how much deuterium, oh, sorry, there's helium-3, helium-4, deuterium, and lithium. And just depending on this ratio of how many, um, this was actually how many matter to antimatter atoms there were, so parts in a billion was around about here. These are the measured values, and uh, depending on this ratio of ordinary matter to uh, nowadays photons, because um, that's based on that asymmetry between matter and, and antimatter, just tells us what these abundances should be. So this is what we get coming out from this primordial cooking to produce some um, helium. But all those, you know, lithium is not exactly a heavy element, and so all the rest of the periodic table was not forged during the Big Bang, it was forged in the stars. So here's um, in a hersprung russell diagram where you've got the, the uh, color of the star, which correlates with the temperature, and then the brightness. So brightness, bright objects up here, dimmer objects here, um, hotter here, colder here. Here's the sun. Um, and these tend to be less massive stars, so low mass stars going up to much more massive stars. And uh, they're the engines that cook up these elements. Our sun is going to become a giant star, and uh, then it's going to blow off its outer layers and finish up as a white dwarf. Okay, so it'll end up down here. The larger stars, um, which actually have very short lifetimes, burn out very quickly, they will turn into supergiants. They'll blow off a lot of their outer layers. We see Betelgeuse doing that right now, and then they will explode as a supernova. And that will spread um, their materials around the universe. And the other key thing is that these different, so this is more like a, you know, our sun, or actually, you know, got a helium core now, hydrogen burning into helium. The more massive stars can burn things into carbon in their core. As you go up, you can start burning all the way to iron. And so Betelgeuse right now has probably burnt most of its core has burnt into iron. So it has this huge iron core. Okay? But it can't make anything heavier than iron, really, because all the way up to iron, you get energy out when you fuse things together. Okay? So you can shine by fusing things together. So you can do fusion all the way up to iron, but iron's the most stable element. After that, it costs energy to fuse them. <clears throat> and you actually get energy out by splitting them. So you can split atoms this way and get energy out, and you can fuse them going this way, but this is where it stops for stable burning of a star, is at iron, because it's the most stable element. And to produce all the heavier elements that we see on the periodic table, they're produced during the supernova explosions. And in fact, the liberation of the iron that is actually in our blood uh, in the hemoglobin is from the supernova blasting this stuff out into space. So it was liberated from supernova explosions. And actually quite a lot of iron and cobalt and things get produced during the supernova explosions. So we end up with this actual picture of recycling happening in the universe where you have these just gas clouds of atomic hydrogen and helium clumping together to form these so-called molecular clouds where you get some uh, other structures in there. Those go into star formation, you get um, stellar burning and heavy element formation, supernovas, then and stellar winds, like blowing off the layers, exploding, sending out the material. Um, that then re-enriches the gas and leads to another cycle of star formation. Like I said, our sun was at the end of what, many of these cycles um, of star formation. Here's uh, one, this is the Swan Nebula, where this process is ongoing. We've got some young stars shining UV light down from the upper left-hand corner. That's actually triggering star formation in the rest of this cloud. Um, similarly, in the Crab Nebula, there's actually an exploded there's the Crab um, supernova remnant there. And these little tiny cocoons, which I'll zoom in on, these are solar systems that are forming up. So the stars dying are actually set, causing like shock waves and causing the gas to clump. So the dying stars are actually giving birth to new stars, and these are little pods with gas and dust and stars forming up inside them, and then planets forming inside those gas disks and those planet protoplanetary disks. I'm almost done here. And here's a computer simulation showing what happens 
with these gas disks around a, um, a newly forming star, how things you get these waves just like you see, these density waves, um, same as you see in, the, uh, in a galaxy. In fact, it's the same codes, basically, that they run to simulate galaxies that they run to uh, simulate these planetary formation. You see the, the stars forming and then cleaning out these zones. And you know the situation in 1994 is we had nine planets. One of them since got demoted, to, so we have eight and a couple of dwarf planets in our solar system. But as of um, September 2011, or late August 2011, there are currently 573 confirmed extrasolar, well, planets in total. Actually, I think that's just the extrasolar. I've got to add our eight into that to get the total. And there's over a 1,000 recently discovered by the Kepler satellite, which have not yet been confirmed. So there's a 1,000 there's a Kepler planets that haven't yet been added to the total because we need to do some more follow-up to make sure they really are planets. But I would say probably talking to the Kepler team, it looks like around, they think that it's going to be around 80 to 90% of those will pan out to be planets. So we're going to have to add another 1,000 or so to this tally. And so, you know, there are a host of planets out there. It seems like it's a generic feature of star formation that you have these um, cocoons that form both the star and the planets around them. So uh, back on the key concepts, um, you can, uh, you know, in viewing your uh, astrobiology and the potential for life out there in this sort of bigger picture of the universe, I think some of the things that strike me are, um, on the one hand, uh, it's extremely rare material that we're talking about that uh, we're thinking of to be involved in planets and, and life, but there are a lot of stars, and it does, you know, so on the flip side, there are vast numbers of stars. Planet formation around stars seems to just be part of the star formation process, so planets are probably going to be pretty generic and... Uh, <clears throat> it's an exciting time in terms of finding out about rocky planets and, and things like that. So uh, it, I think it's, a, it's an exciting time in, in cosmology and astrophysics and also uh, this connection with planetary science and astrobiology. So I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. I have some questions. Thanks a lot, Neil. Dude. I have a bunch of questions. Mm -hmm. but you guys have any questions to start off with or should I start it off? So, uh, with the seventy percent of the matter in the universe, or with that graph, being dark matter. Um, so, with like seventy percent of the universe is being dark matter. D uh, that dark matter is dark contributing, or oh, the dark energy was right. the most, and then there's the dark matter. Yes, is that dark matter contributing to that gravitational lensing that you see when you? The dark matter, yes. The dark matter does. The dark energy doesn't. Um, that dark, the the gravitational lensing that you see. That has to be from material that's like clumped up and the light sort of bending as it goes around that clump. And in fact, our own galaxy is surrounded by, you know, our galaxy is in a giant dark matter halo. In fact, most of the mass of our galaxy and the thing that's, you know, those satellites and everything, they're all in this big, you know, pile of dark matter. Um, the dark energy does not clump up. It stays uniform. And so we don't see its effect from the bending of the the light when we're looking at the galaxies, we see its effect on the overall expansion of the universe. Yeah. And so that dark matter uh, is, it, it's not homogeneous across the universe. No, okay. no, it's clumped up. All, it, I mean, according to, I mean, that's the, the theory and the only way to actually get the galaxies to form up and look like they do, if you just want to use Einstein's theory of gravity, is to have dark matter. It's actually impossible to form up galaxies with just ordinary matter, according to Einstein's theory. It just, they wouldn't have formed. So you could either, you've got really told two alternatives. You have to either come up with a new theory of gravity, and people have looked at that option, or you have to have dark matter. And there's a lot of lines of evidence now that really point it to being dark matter rather than a modification to gravity. But a direct detection of the dark matter particles would end that debate, I think. So let me... Uh... You know, there, there's a lot in your talk for an astrobiologist or a student of astrobiology, and you started to go here at the end of your talk talking about the likelihood of Earth-like planets, and, um, you know, it makes me think about the Drake equation and some of the mm -hmm. components of the Drake equation, and, you know, one of his 
uh, one of the components there was uh, defining the lifespan of a civilization. And if, if you think about Kepler and some of the things you've talked about, we may be able to observe an Earth-like planet, maybe even one that will <clears throat> overlap in a habitable zone when we're observing it. But with the time scales that we're talking about and the, the speed mm -hmm. of light, are, are we actually able to observe it within what we think a lifespan of a civilization would be? That doesn't look very promising at all. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, <clears throat> of course, I'd say that, you know, lifespans of civilizations and things are probably some of the most uncertain factors that go into the Drake equation if you want to actually look for Absolutely. intelligent life um, because, you know, making assumptions that their species uh, behave like ours. Um, but the possibility of holding a conversation or any, or even getting, you know, encountering some other life form that at a advanced level of development, for one, it would be a terribly stilted conversation. Even if, even if by some miracle Tau Ceti turns out to have rocky planets around, which is a possibility, and there happens to be life on those, which it's, it has a lot more debris than we do, so they're probably getting bombarded a lot more, so it might be tricky for, in fact, um, Jupiter, sorry, yeah, no, Jupiter. Jupiter, they now think that Jupiter is responsible for cleaning out a lot of the mess from our solar system so that we don't get bombarded. But anyway, let's say we have a conversation with someone, and that's only 12 light years away. So every 12 years you get to, you know, get a reply to the thing you told them 12 years ago. And that's the closest problem, you know, one of the closest possibilities. Most of them we're talking about are way further away than that. And, and the chances of, you know, the nearby one. I mean, the chance of any one being at that level of development is so low that the, the chance of overlap and, and communication is extremely small. Um, so I think it's far more, uh, for, for me at least, it's, I'm far more interested in the uh, more primitive forms of life as, as the things to be and things or that we actually have evidence on. for presence of life in a certain history of planetary right. history, and we have some hope in the not too distant future in terms of <clears throat> being able to look at um, the atmospheres of planets, because with the Kepler satellite, the way that they're looking for planets is they're looking for transits. So actually looking for the very minute dimming as a planet moves in front of its. Um, the star that it's orbiting. So of course that has to be lined up just right for them. So it just stared at this whole field of stars that didn't know which ones to look at and just, you know, look for any amount of dimming. And these dimmings are minute. I mean, they're a tiny fraction of the sun's total output. Um, and in fact, now with, with some of them, they've not just seen a, they can actually now start to see not just dimming, they can actually see uh, some brightenings as it goes around and then you get the light from the planets that actually pick up some of the light you know, reflected from the planet. But in the future, what you can do with a planet that's transit, transiting in front using this, that starlight as a um, back illumination, it illuminates through the atmosphere of the planet and then you can actually look for what gases are in the atmosphere by seeing the absorption lines of the, of the starlight going through the planetary atmosphere. We don't have there's nothing, you know, like a cross section of the individual point in the transit. Yeah, well, just the, the stars there with its atmosphere around it and the light shining through the atmosphere, if it's encountering different, you know, it's going to get absorbed differently by the gases in the atmosphere. And we can actually look for what the chemical composition of those atmospheres are. And as you would know, there's, you know, markers that of things you would look for in an atmosphere that would indicate that there was biological activity going on just you know, out of equilibrium reactions that really shouldn't be there otherwise. And that's not yet something that the Kepler satellite, for example, can't do that. The James Webb won't be able to do that. But we can build things within our lifetime that can do that. So it's possible that we could actually get at least these indirect signatures of life around some of these planets. So I think that's the most exciting thing, at least because it's, it's something that we can really hope to be doing, uh, you know, in our lifetimes. Yeah, and we'll have uh, Vicki Meadows from University of Washington will 
be joining the class too, giving a little bit of talk on sort of her virtual planetary lab and just trying to do that, trying to understand uh, aspects of atmospheres and how that can mm -hmm. impact payloads or instrumentation on some of these uh, things. The other uh, question I have, I think we got a couple minutes, is, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you talked about the birth of the universe and a trajectory. And then towards the end, you talked about kind of a cycle of remodeling. Um, well, are we on a trajectory? And if so, where are we going? Or are we, have we reached a steady state of remodeling? So as, the, as far as the universe goes, there are ideas that suggest uh, some kind of cycles for universes as well. It's on the, on the bigger scales. Um, right now, what, what it looks like is we're on a kind of a, you know, the data points to a one-way trajectory for our universe that we're expanding. Actually, the rate of expansion continuing to increase, what that's going to mean if you were to look forward um, you know, say another 10, 20 billion years from now, is that the other galaxies that we currently see further out, the space between us and those galaxies will have expanded so much that those will actually be shifted outside of the horizon that we can see. We'll just be in an island galaxy, which will be a conglomeration of um, the Andromeda galaxy. That's what this last little simulation was, Andromeda colliding with um, the Milky Way. We'll just be this island galaxy and that's all you'll see. The whole universe will just be this one galaxy. Everything else will have moved too far away for us to see it anymore. And then the expansion will continue. Um, so it'll be very boring, actually, for cosmologists 20 billion years from now, because they'll just have one galaxy. And they'll have no way to actually access information about anything else about the universe. Uh, and then it just basically gets really cold, um, runs out of energy, and and everything just gets this kind of the cold death of the universe is the picture that we have. Now, there are ideas that say that our universe was, um, that this process actually was caused by the collision of two higher dimensional universes, then bounce and they go out in these other dimensions and they come back and hit again. And so that there might be a... Some cycle on a cycle larger scale. on a larger scale. Um, and there's also this... There's hope. I mean, <laughs> we, we would not necessarily, <laughs> no one's going to survive that event, <laughs> that reprocessing event. But uh, if it makes, you know, I think we like the idea that things continue. And I think also this picture of the um, ginger root of the eternal, you know, sprouting of universes, while they might not be connected directly to ours, in fact, that one where it recollides is really not connected because nothing really survives that process and gets reused. It's sort of a almost a, a, a recreation Do event. Over, yeah. yeah. Um, but just the idea that this kind of goes on somehow seems psychologically yeah. important yeah. to us. <laughs> I think so. Any other quick questions for Neil? All right. Well, thanks again. Okay. Well, I will um Are we out? <laughs>